Hello, everyone. Welcome today. I hope that you're here to join us for what will sure to be a fascinating discussion. My name is Dr. Danielle Cooper, and I bring you greetings from the University of New Haven, where I serve as an Associate Professor of Criminal Justice, as well as the Director of Research at the Taliuk Justice Institute. Hopefully you've been joining us for the past few months, but in case you haven't, today is a culminating treat. Um, we bring to you what our, our our colleagues and our friends, but people who really offer um, both uh, a wealth of lived and professional experience. Um, so I'm going to first pass to uh, Cindy from One Standard of Justice so that she can really get you primed for this conversation and then we'll move forward from there. So I look forward to our time together. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We will be taking questions and answers all throughout this discussion. So there's a Q&A section that makes it easier for me to find your questions. Please use that section. And of course, this is a recorded webinar. So um, please proceed accordingly. Thank you. Pass to you, Cindy. All right. Today, um, good morning, first of all, to everyone. Uh, my name is Cindy Prizio. I'm the executive director of One Standard of Justice. Today is the last in our five part webinar series. In them, we have tried to share the real science around sexual offending and the risk for reoffending, the research by practitioners in the field and a woman's journey to find the justice she couldn't find in the criminal legal system by insisting on the use of restorative justice. For those of you who missed Marley's story, the video along with all our webinars will be available next week. You will hear how Marley not only survived sexual violence, she's thrived and come to heal by forgiving the person who harmed her. Today, in our last webinar, we conclude our series by bringing back internationally respected researcher Carl Hansen and Senator Gary Winfield to talk about the role of science in making public policy and the influence of politics, especially around the difficult issue of sexual offending. The reason we created this series of webinars is simple. We believe that any sexual offense is one too many. We believe that most of our laws and policies are not validated by science, are extraordinarily expensive, do little to prevent sexual harm, and once harm has been done, do little to bring closure for both survivor victims and offenders, and instead create more harm for everyone, including their families and our communities. We have shown a light on the humanity of authors of harm and survivor victims. And hopefully in doing so, we've de-stigmatized both sides of the same coin. We believe the significant savings that can come from developing policies that better reflect science and harm reduction should be redirected toward reducing sexual violence as well as reduce the harm done to all parties. Ultimately, it is up to educating both the public and legislators about both the facts and real options. In order to do this, we must learn to have the tough conversations and include all stakeholders. Instead, what is a common occurrence, um, as soon as sexual offending comes up, there's a phenomenon, phenomenon that takes place. Lawmakers, not all, and others use the reptilian part of the brain, which says all offenders are monsters. Don't go there, shut down. Shutting down now, do not engage. The emotion of this highly charged, controversial and sensitive subject takes over above all else. One standard of justice is taking a hiatus and will return late summer with a new webinar series on prevention beginning with our high-risk youth. We welcome hearing from you over the break. I'd like to share now a short film clip entitled Shauna's Story from the David Feige documentary, Untouchable. Untouchable is available on Amazon Prime. You'll find Shauna's story along with another short video, Frightening and High on our website, along with today's recording. This clip spotlights in a few minutes, many, if not all of the challenges before this organization and ultimately the lawmakers. 
a word on frightening and high. Every aspect of our legal system, our laws, and our public policies have been built around a false premise ever since Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy quoted a factually inaccurate Psychology Today article claiming the risk that sex offenders, sex offenders, uh, will commit new crimes is frightening and high. I highly recommend you have a look. Thank you for being with us today. Many of you have been with us since the beginning. Hopefully you've gotten to know us better. Thank you to Dr. Danielle Cooper for enriching our programs with your knowledge, expertise, experience, and cheer. Thank you, Carl Hansen. Couldn't have done it without you. And finally, to the amazing Senator Winfield for co-sponsoring us and giving us his time in spite of being in session and for his tireless encouragement and support to this organization and its unpopular social justice cause. Yes, it is a social justice cause. At the conclusion of the clip on Shauna's story, we'll turn it over to Dr. Cooper. Thank you so much. My whole life, even when I was younger, I always wanted to be a mom. My daughter, I mean, she doesn't know what I did, but she knows that I did something I shouldn't have. When I was a teenager, it was my birthday, and um, decided to kind of have like a little party together. And we were drinking, dancing, and you know, doing things like that. And then um, it ended up that the underage male and I slept together. He put his arms around me and he was like, well, I, I just don't want you to think I'm taking advantage of you while you're drunk. And I was like, I don't think that. The next morning, his mom called me and she said, my son hates me. And she said, I just filed against you. I got a call from an investigator and they said they wanted to talk to me and ask me some questions. And I went, and she uh, said if I was honest, I wouldn't get thrown in jail. I was basically told, if we go to trial, you will get 20 to 25 years for this if they find you guilty. If you take a plea, minimal time, lifetime registry, lifetime probation. I am defined under the registry when you look me up, child molestation actually a level three, which is the worst of the worst. This is the last time that I'm gonna be able to take you and your brother to the park. I'm sorry. It's okay. People stay on these registries and on the internet for decades, maybe for life. You have a whole broad range of crimes that are classified as sexual offenses. So it includes the 19-year-old who's dating the 14-year-old, the person who's urinating in public in the wrong circumstance, and the person who violently rapes in a sadistic way. And yet these registries collapse those distinctions and, and catch all those people. This new law has forced registered sex offenders to live in these tents. More than 50 sex offenders live here because they cannot live near where children congregate. If I go stay with anybody, I'm going to get arrested. If I go live with my family, I'm going to get arrested. And if you don't get here on time, you get arrested. I never got in trouble with the, with the law. Never got a ticket. Going out with this girl that was only 15 years old, by the time I was 19, four months in jail, five years probation and a lifetime of the registration. Here's the thing, whenever people get very, very frightened, they are willing to dispense with the protections of the Constitution. That's what's going on right now with sex offenders. The media has kept everybody in an uproar. The legislatures have jumped on the bandwagon. They never lost a vote for being mean to sex offenders. It's a race to see who could be harshest, who could be strictest, who could have the most draconian laws about sex offenders. You can't find a more hot and button issue. The great fear among politicians is being thought of as soft on crime. The sentiment has been to err on the side of safety, even though maybe the net has been cast too wide. 
An Elko County woman spending the rest of her life in prison for having a 13-year-old boy touch her breasts. They were having sex in front of dozens of people in the middle of the afternoon. They're on the sex offender registry. Half a dozen students are set to face child pornography charges. You are now classified as a sex offender. You have been kicked out of college. You're not allowed to use the internet. You're not allowed to live with your dad because he lives too close to a school. Do you think that the punishment fit the crime? I've worked about 10 different jobs since I've been convicted. But then um, there was a spot that came open to write the paper, and I went from working at a gas station to, oh wow, I'm writing for a newspaper. Like, I'm doing something. This could really lead somewhere. And then there was a complaint. Somebody found out that I was a sex offender. They just said that we can't have your name out in the public like that. So we're going to have to let you go. I have the skills and the personality for it. It's just that one thing stops me from moving up over and over. This stops me from being the best mom I can be. 20 years down the road when my kids are grown and I want to buy an RV and just go travel the world, I can't do that because I have to be available for probation and I have to be available to take polygraphs. And if I go to a new state, I have to register with that state. I want to show my kids something different than Oklahoma. I, I, I tell my children all the time, there's a big world out there. Let them know that when it's time to pick a college, honey, go, go, go see the world. Go do so much more than I did. I think that you judge a society by how it treats the least among you. And I think at this point in our society, you know, sex offenders are considered to be the least among us. If you're willing to carve, you know, kind of a hole in the Constitution for them, you know, you can do it for anybody. It is as if we've taken this entire category and said, these are not human beings, we don't care about them. We put all of them on the registry with the same restrictions. And that doesn't make sense even as a public safety issue. It doesn't make sense as public policy, and it certainly doesn't make any sense in terms of justice. So hopefully you've taken a moment to digest what was, you know, approximately six minutes from the film, Untouchable. I want to bring forth <clears throat> really our speakers today, Senator Winfield and Dr. Hansen as I will be engaging them. Before I do, I just want to reflect a little bit about what you just watched, right? Um, one of the things and, and the reason, you know, that Cindy pointed out about this work, both generally uh, for one standard of justice, but specifically in terms of this webinar series is how do we show up as people? How do we have conversations that are sometimes tough conversations? And how do we you know, move through what are the shared values such as public safety or, you know, justice or all of these things and, and actually make them real. And so um, I just want to first direct a few of my questions to you, Dr. Hansen, and then I'll bring you into the conversation as well, uh, Senator Winfield. So we saw a, long, a young lady and, and her name was Shauna, right? And so we really got to experience her story, see her, but also see the multi-generational layers of it. Can you can you just speak to us watching what is this obvious person who has remorse, uh, is presenting themselves as a sympathetic individual? A lot of concern is about who she is and her threat to public safety. Can you speak to what is the likelihood that she would reoffend in general or reoffend in her specific sense in terms of engaging sexually with a minor? Yeah, the risk that you know a person with her profile would reoffend is very, very small. It's it's basically no different than the general population. There's a number of features uh, that would describe her that would make her, you know, no different than the, the bus driver, probably uh, on the bus, would be probably higher risk than, than she would as the, the person. So yes, this, she isn't, um, the, these, the restrictions on her aren't serving a public safety function. 
in one of the clips, they show, you know, a, a news person speaking about the breadth of the registry and how, you know, we really have individuals who might uh, range from indecent exposure to, you know, violent victimization, you know, and attacks. And so in terms of Shauna, is, is a person like her, who's a, a, a younger person or young adult who's then been engaged sexually with a minor, is that, is that exceptional? Is that rare? Is that normal? Can you speak to that? And can you also just speak to how common is that in, in general in terms of just, but also on the registry, like when we speak of then yeah. people who are captured on the registry? Yeah, there's two things. A couple of things about her case that, that are unusual. They're genuinely unusual. One is she's a woman uh, and that most of the, the people on the registry are men. Uh, sexual offending is usually something done by men to others. Um, so that's a bit unusual. Um, she's also, she's a very sympathetic character. She's very likable. And not everybody on the registry um, would have that description, but a lot of them would. Um, but in terms of the low risk, there is a range. Uh, and there's uh, many people who are justifiably you know, high risk and you probably would want to worry about them. But there's a lot that would be a uh, similar risk level. There would be no higher risk than, than she would, even though if they looked uh, very different. And particularly because the registry is a sort of long-term um, potentially lifetime uh, type of activity that people who may start out at being moderately high risk or worth monitoring after 5, 10, 15 years, they start to look like everybody else. And because the registry has been going on for quite a while, most of the people on the registry now, I suspect, are of no, uh, no more than minimal risk. I'm going to bring you back, Senator Winfield, because the registry at the heart of it is a policy, right? It is a public safety attempt uh, in which we have targeted uh, a specific, uh, you know, criminal justice behavior that has been identified. And so if we're listening and hearing and understanding what Dr. Hansen is telling us um, about, you know, low risk versus high risk and the broad representation on the registry. And then also in the video, them kind of speaking about like, what does that mean from a, from a policy sense? You know, I'm just wondering if you would comment, like, do you see these conversations taking place amongst your colleagues and acknowledgement that there's a broad array of things happening and that that might be problematic from actually the public safety goal or how does this, you know, from a collegial sense tie into conversations you have, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, good morning. And I, I think that most of my colleagues know very little about the subject. Um, and the little that they do know comes from uh, people telling them things that are scary um, and suggesting that uh, while we know there are a broad range of individuals who are covered by um, the registries we have and the policy we have, uh, that they all would tend to operate in the same way. And I think Cindy, when she uh, began, talked about uh, politicians using the reptilian part of the brain. I think uh, if we understand the limbic system and how it works, we recognize that um, it's not an act of usage, but that it's, it's the way that human beings tend to function in response to a, a certain stimulus, which is you know, the reason advertisement, ad people in advertising operate the way that they do. So when people come and they, present to you the scary story, uh, politicians are going to respond as human beings, but they're also going to think about the way that uh, the people they represent are going to respond. And I think that's part of the reason you see uh, the response that you see that I don't think is uh, very useful for public policy. Thank you. Let me ask you a follow up because, you know, I, now that we understand what people might or might not really be, you know, grasping, let's talk about the ideal, right? We're here because we're trying to bring people closer to information, such as what Dr. Hansen represents, the understanding of risk assessment, the understanding of the array of persons who are involved in, in engaging in various types of behavior. If we got the knowledge to your colleagues, then how do you feel like that could or should inform public policy? What's, what's your initial thoughts about that? Well, I, I will say that could and should are two different things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think, look, I think that uh, people sometimes forget that politicians are completely human, right? Meaning that uh, information is important to what we do but that the emotional aspect has uh, more weight than I think people often give it credit for. 
Um, and I, and I, in my conversations with uh, people who are in the advocacy world, I've suggested to them that uh, you have to be about the business of connecting to both sides of that human being. And so if you bring this information uh, to, to people in the spaces where I operate, or what you're going to find yourself feeling is frustrated because you're not going to get the response that is appropriate for the information. That's just factual. Um, I'll give you a good example. So for many years, we've been talking about the development of the human brain, at what age uh, we actually become uh, less compulsive. Uh, we talk about the age around 25. Uh, in public policy, at least in the state of Connecticut, uh, that means very little unless we're trying to do something that is um, not a positive uh, uh, step in criminal justice. Uh, it's not that the science isn't known, it's that uh, politicians tend to have an assumption that uh, people in the public feel a certain way. And so they are concerned to, to a large degree about uh, being reelected, it's a reality. And so what we have to figure out is how do we use those same things that are true uh, in terms of fear and other emotions for our cause? And, that, and that's, if, if there's a place where we don't do as great of a job, that's where it is. I think one of the things that you're tapping into really nicely is there's the world of data, right? There's numbers, there's counting, there's understanding those pieces. And then, you know, there's an equally valuable world of lived experience, um, maybe even sometimes more valuable because it helps us understand how to understand those numbers. It helps us understand how we might need to continue to rethink the research sometimes. But, you know, a lot of times people aren't thinking about those human stories. And I just want to bring us back to the point that, you know, um, when we think of, you know, Shauna, uh, she also presented not just herself, but her community, her kids, you know, Know, and when we think of, you know, person who has done harm versus person who has received the harm, sometimes we have very narrow ideas of who those persons are. And so I just want to talk for a second about Shauna's kids. We saw her experiences with them change. We saw her really um, try and encourage them to have opportunities that she didn't have for her by herself. You know, that was her way of really trying to you know, come to peace with her her punishment, right? So I, I may be restricted, but I really want others around me. And so I'm just wondering, you know, can you comment, you know, is the legal system, you know, responsible for the shaming and blaming, the re-victimizing, like what is the role that the justice system plays in doing the harm um, and in creating an expansion of victims to some extent? You know, is, is that a part of the conversation? Is that part of where we need to be moving at all? I think the justice system does uh, immense harm, uh, not only to those who've been in the system and have left the system, uh, it keeps acting against them, but as you suggested, it's their families and their communities. Um, you know, we see this and understand it in other contexts, right? When we talk about uh, things, for instance, like the war on drugs, we, we get a sense of, yes, this system is not doing uh, good. And that's taken a long time to be quite frank, right? We, we didn't initially understand the harm that we were doing. Um, I think it's taking a very long time for people to come to understand it with the population that we're talking about here. I think the justice system also functions uh, largely on, on that limbic system that we're talking about. So even when we're talking about uh, victims, uh, we don't mean victims when we say victims. Uh, what, what we tend to mean are certain class of victims. Uh, during this session that we had in the General Assembly in Connecticut, I, I began to talk about the white supremacy of victims, right? Victimhood, because often what we're talking about is a woman who's had an, an, an instance of a crime happen to her, who tends to side with the law and order side of the conversation. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about people like myself, who from the time that I uh, was, was born into this planet, uh, have experienced crime after crime after crime after crime, because we don't see those people as victims. We don't recognize that they have a perspective. And so when we talk, we have this conversation, it is informed usually by a small subset of victims and we don't get a complete picture of what the victims even think. Yeah, wow, wow. I'm gonna move to you for a second, uh, Dr. Hansen, because I wanna offer some clarifications, right? So Shauna is a person who's been convicted of an offense against a minor. So her, some of her experiences are very specific. Not all individuals who are on the registry or all individuals who are convicted of sexual offenses actually have 
restrictions about their proximity to children or to places where children corral. Can you just clarify any about that, right? Just from a general individual who have been um, here in the United States versus Canada. My understanding here in the United States is that not all of, of individuals who experience the broad array of offenses actually have prohibitions for their experiences with children. Thoughts about that? Well, the, uh, the, the US is a big place and there's mm -hmm. lots of different uh, implementations of these laws. And I'm, I'm Canadian, I just identify that. And we have a totally different uh, registration uh, procedure, which is based on, it's police only. So our registration uh, is, uh, they have to give their address essentially once a year to the, and there's very few breaches of, of um, uh, failure to register offenses, because the goal is to know where these people are, it's not to put them in jail. Um, mm -hmm. So if somebody fails um, ought to register, the first intervention is like, did you remember? Right? Maybe we should get an agenda. Maybe you should put it in your calendar. <laughs> you know, that's the first intervention by the local police. It's not you know, thinking that they're willful trying to hide. It's, it's trying to uh, keep track of them. And it's a time limited thing and there's sort of risk thresholds built into it. Um, so in the States, um, there's a whole variety of different uh, things. Most of it's public um, and many of the people will be uh, public. Um, and there will be restrictions. Uh, uh, the publicness of the registry is one which is perceived as most harmful by the people, who, by the registrants. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the people don't like to register at all, which is understandable, but they particularly don't like it when it becomes public. And that has a, a large and very obvious consequences on, uh, to the, uh, for the people on the registry. Sometimes they have to, um, there's restrictions on what they can, well, often there's restrictions on what they can do. And there's also, it's not unusual for a person who has any uh, sexual offense history to be prohibited from going to parks, even if their victim was a, a office work coworker. So the, the, the laws are, are very imprecise in how their application in the public protection. You spoke previously about some of the, the you know, special unique features about Shauna that uh, most commonly individuals who are committing these types of offenses are male, but can you also comment about parenthood, right? Part of what, you know, she's experiencing is the complexity of being a person who's a caretaker of children while then also being convicted of these crimes. How common is that? How, how it, much It's are very parents? common. There's uh, many people on the registry have children, uh, either before they were on the registry or after. Um, so parenting is is a, and it's a, it's a really tough situation. And I think it was nicely described in the film of the simple thing of today I can take you to the park, but tomorrow I can't. Um, and so what is actually what is being, uh, what is what how are we safer by that type of decision and what what harms are being done? So we have to think about that very carefully. I'm sure this is right one of just many ways that this policy plays out and has like you know expanded impacts it's not just for the person who necessarily committed the offense but impacts how the community operates impacts how others can you just speak more generally right um about the the cost and harms of the registry like so be, beyond you know this particular thing that we just discussed what other broader things would you like people to be aware of that are related well, to registries this is um criminal justice generally, but uh, sex offending specifically, is economic harms in the sense that we want people to be working and to be productive members. And I've, there's no shortage of cases of people who have skills, who have valuable skills, uh, who normally would work and want to work, but are prevented from doing so because of their um, uh, being, a, uh, being a registrant. And so our economic productivity, there's a, a whole class of people who are being prevented from uh, participating in the workforce, which I think is uh, unfortunate. So it's an obvious and quantifiable harm uh, that, that uh, from this one. I'll turn to you for a second, uh, Senator Winfield. Money, money is a is a piece in politics, right? This this fiscal no appropriations, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know. Uh, how does that play into the potential barriers for reform about this? Because, you know, we talk about, is, is this a low cost reform? Is this a high cost reform? As we think about, is the opportunity there to reform the registry or not, or reform what, you know, is it, is part of the concern that's discussed that this is expensive reform at all, or where are the concerns economically related to how uh, this social justice portion might be moving uh, in the future? 
So I think largely we don't get into the economic cost. We, we stop uh, at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, these people are scary, full stop, right? Uh, but I do think that uh, weighing the cost is important, right? Uh, both the actual uh, fiscal cost and the uh, social opportunity cost. Um, Dr. Hansen spoke about the fact that uh, people can't work. Think about, the, think about the notion that at least in this country, healthcare is tied to employment. Uh, so there are costs, uh, not only for the individual who cannot get the type of health care they might want, uh, but there are costs to the society for paying for those individuals at some point, right, in catastrophic health care. And we could, we could take that notion and extrapolate it further and begin to see that there are real costs, not only to the individual who we think uh, we're acting upon because there's some, some other, uh, but, but even to our own selves. And, and then the cost, of course, um, to public safety, right? So uh, people always think they know a lot because they have this information, but you know much less than you, you think you know. Um, and the, the cost of doing this, uh, we've seen, I think it's in the film that there's, there's, there was a group of people who, uh, you know, they for a period of time are living under bridges and living in places where you couldn't actually track them. So if this population were dangerous uh, as a whole, uh, considering that there's some people who might be, but if this population as a whole were, were dangerous, then you would actually be making people less safe, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there are so many costs built into this, but the problem is that the conversation start, stops at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to figure out ways to uh, open this conversation up, which is why I think the conversation about victims becomes as important as uh, making sure that people understand these people as humans. Because if I come in as a victim and start telling my story, but it doesn't end the way you think it's supposed to end, it ends a little differently supporting reforms, then people might be able to listen. I think you, you just, you raised some really good points about once again, what are the human pieces that sometimes people are struggling to grapple with? So when I see someone, I see their behavior, I see the stigma, I see my, I feel the embodied reaction to whatever it is I did or didn't want them to do. But then do I know that there's also this nexus with, there's a clear knowledge and you did a good job of, of teasing this out general criminal justice knowledge, we are very concerned about what does it mean when people are in economic strain? What does it mean when people have to make decisions about their housing, their food, their childhood, because that puts them in innovation that might not always be legal innovation for lack of a better word. That puts them, uh, you know, in places and spaces where um, we really have to challenge how we condemn the person versus condemn the environment that, you know, is also feeding parts of that behavior when we want to hold people accountable. And accountability is a really important part of the, the, the policy conversation. How do we hold these people accountable? If we don't hold them accountable, will we have more crime? Um, I think another thing just to tease out uh, from, from what I was hearing is, you know, also at this nexus is a lack of realization of the overall low reoffending that happens for individuals who are committing this type of crime. We're talking about individuals who commit sexual offenses have relatively drastically low uh, arrest rates or re-arrest rates in comparison, especially to other crimes, but, but especially that aren't registered. Um, and so then when we think and we have that fear um, and we then reduce the opportunities, then it also also becomes this concern about potentially self-fulfilling prophecy. Have we put people in the situation just by, not by nature of what type of crime they have already committed, but by nature of the general stigma of the system that makes them less able to access some of the things that we're trying to do that would help people um, be able to be productive and, and contribute if, to the system. If, if, if I could, I think, yeah. you know, part, part of, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Dr. Go answer. ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what it, what it is we are intending to do here? Um, and I think we are responding, but we're not stopping to ask ourselves what it is we're actually intending to do. If it's about accountability, then fine, Let, let's deal with accountability, but accountability and punishment aren't the same thing. Uh, also, I think uh, part of the reason I've begun to focus on uh, victims in ways that I haven't in the past, both in this space and in other spaces, is because I think the question is, what do we think we're doing for those victims, right? So uh, I think some people know that I have a uh, uh, sexual abuse in my past, right? Um, and it has had huge impacts on the way that my life has been lived, uh, even uh, my understanding of my attraction to women and why I'm attracted to them and 
all kinds of things that stem from having had that experience. I can tell you as an individual, and I don't speak for all victims, but I can tell you as an individual, I don't know what value there would be to me to have the person who uh, did what they did to me uh, punished for the rest of their life. I absolutely have no understanding of what value that would be to me. And yet in a conversation, uh, we speak as if that that's the reason why we're doing the things we're doing, right? For public safety and to protect the victims. And I think, you know, we, we have to, and this is what I did when we did the work on a death penalty, we have to find uh, people who've experienced uh, the tragic things that they've experienced and have those people help to blow a hole in the concepts that we hold dear. Um, because once that starts to happen and people are faced, you know, we put the mirror up to them, faced with the reality that what they've been doing is just pure punishment. It's not about accountability. Uh, and it doesn't really take into account the victims. As a matter of fact, I think to some degree, the way we establish public policy is a front to victims. Um, once you can once you can do that, I think you can begin to change the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. No, oh, excellent points. I, I just wanted to say that you know, many, um, I guess most of us want no more crimes, right? So people have done something horrible. We don't like it, maybe something less horrible, but these are things that are serious and we have to take those seriously. But what we want fundamentally is that these individuals don't do it again. And if you look at what people need for them to not do it again, getting caught is probably worthwhile, but it's not the length of punishment, like shorter or longer punishments don't make a difference. It's getting caught, uh, it makes a difference, the, which means people coming forward and reporting it. Um, the, but after they've been caught, after the sanctions been applied, what helps them um, reintegrate? There's really three things you can think about. One is physically a place to live. Like if you just like a place, you know, not being out in the, in the streets. Two is a community that basically is able, they're able to relate to, um, you know, some people they can relate to. And three is meaningful activities. So either work or volunteer activities. So some integration. And if you think of again, those three elements in place, you have a place to live, some, you know, pro-social friends, and you have um, some employment or activities, the rates are much lower. And then you think about how are our policies promoting those things. Um, and in some ways they could, in some ways we're pushing very, very far away from that. You really laid out that very clearly. And, you know, part just to tie back into one of the points Senator Winfield made about like when we, we speak about, once again, the offenses or the offender and the victim, right? We're, we're also speaking about, you know, the advocates and how they show up and how they are also pushing for sometimes policy. Dr. Hansen, can you speak to a bit of like, how do we translate that message that you just shared, you know, to the advocates that are potentially the victim advocates? Can you speak to some of the pushback that is often in, in play when we speak specifically to reform for individuals convicted of sexual offenses? There, I guess we have to separate, I, in my head, we separate out punishment from public protection measures. So sometimes people do bad things and you want to punish them. And that's just what we do. Just accept that. Um, but don't confuse it with public protection. So sometimes you do things just for punishment reasons. Once you start into the public protection, then maybe um, you're able to get people who are open enough to, to look at the consequences of the choices. And if you think about, okay, we too want no more victims. We also want these people to not reoffend. That's what we want. What does it take? And does this move in that direction? Can you stay long enough in the conversation? I, I really like Senator uh, Winfield's comment that we stop way too soon. Can you stay in the conversation long enough to think about, okay, then what? And if you are, then this may be possible. And it's the public protection argument that I think that, or context where we can probably open up the most, uh, um, uh, most, find most common ground. Let me kind of reverse that question for you, Senator Winfield, you know, as in your role, right, you have to hear not only your colleagues and their thoughts, but you know, you, we show up as the public and we offer testimony. You spoke to the large emotionality, right, that often might come from a victim's lived experience as they're showing what happens, but what advice might you give to the advocates on the side of one standard of justice, the advocates for individuals who are trying to speak to the lived experiences of those, you know, who are, are negatively experiencing this public policy, 
is it that they need more emotional stories? Is it, you know, we talked about the economic impact and what, like what's missing that maybe they might bring more to the forefront that could help with the misunderstanding or would help with the hard part? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, I think the first thing all advocates have to recognize is that um, facts are important, but they don't always matter. Uh, time is a crucial part of, of any of this stuff. Uh, you know, we, we did a bill this year on solitary confinement. Uh, I've been working on that uh, since before I was, since I was still classified as an activist. And that was a long, <laughs> long time ago. Um, and, and so I think that's important because if you're going to stay in this fight, you have to recognize how long the fight is to begin with, right? These fights take 10, 15, 20 years uh, to, to get what is basically incremental change uh, for a lot of people. Sometimes we get lucky. But that's how that's how these things work. I do think um, recognizing that story is important, that uh, a common uh, a common emotion, a common experience can help people to see you different. I, I did a training with um, uh, Cindy and some of her people on storytelling. I tell stories on, on the side as a hobby. Uh, and um, I think it's important because people will come to the General Assembly and uh, they get there at least to connect it their three minutes and you know they're trying to get everything in and they haven't thought about the fact that you know that three minutes is critical and for me when I was an activist the, what the three minutes was for was to get people asking me questions it wasn't just to get everything out um, and so I would practice telling a story to the point where I knew the, the the beats of the story when you would laugh when you would cry when you would feel something uh, that would generate a question in, in the people in front of me. Now, there's no guarantee, but I will tell you as an activist, I got more questions asked than most people did because I went and prepared and I knew what I was trying to accomplish. And my account, what I was trying to accomplish wasn't to uh, act as though the people in front of me didn't have information or the legislators, people come give them information all the time. It was to act as though there was some barrier between them where they sit and where they should be acting upon that information. And the goal of the story was to begin to open this up. Um, and I think that's what we really should be uh, striving for. I don't think you should be sitting down thinking, I'm gonna say something in three minutes or five minutes or whatever it is, that's gonna be a revelation uh, of facts they've never heard before and then they're gonna start moving. That That's probably not right. I want you to know you just cracked the case wide open. I've lived here in Connecticut from 2015. You know my work and the things we do policy related. And I'm always telling people so at work that the, the, the knowledge of the policy operations is very hard. Keeping track of it, how long the session is, where your bill is, where it died, all of those things are very, very, very confusing. But more recently, I've also been trying to do the work of what does it mean to show up and testify, right? Because of my work with the police transparency, stuff, all of these things. You're the first person that really pointed out that I should be trying to get people to ask me questions. You know, you really try. And in the training, you say, how can I offer a strong pitch of what I believe? But you're right. They already might have that knowledge. How do I really say something that would make them ask me more so that we could be in dialogue, that we can really move beyond um, where we were? Wow. I think that's, that's, that's helpful information because the, the stories are there. We're not at a lack of stories. The skills yeah, I, of how we translate um, is what we got to build. I think I think often we're all, well. When I first started activism, I was trained the same way. You have to go in there and give them all this information. I, and one of the, the beneficial things for me is I do also step to the side and watch what's happening. And I recognize that that just didn't work. Uh, and then started trying to figure out. So what is it we're missing? And recognize that the the story part the using the limbic system for our purposes part wasn't happening. And once I began doing that, other activists would be like, I don't know why they're always asking you questions. And then I would tell, I would tell them and they would just completely ignore it and go back to doing what we're trained to do. But I do think it's important to, to use that to our advantage. I'm gonna ride this a little longer. Let me turn to you, Carl, because I, I showed up for testimony this year, but that's mainly because I did a thing where I pushed my students to do something and then you have to show up too. Um, <laughs> as an academic, uh, I, I, we often 
our neutrality is important. Our, it is important to our work. It's important that while there, there are passions that we might have, we really want to show up as knowledgeable and credible. Um, can you speak any to uh, whether you've testified or individuals like yourself who, who you know, speak to that knowledge? You know, do you see individuals like yourself showing up locally, showing up nationally? Are those requests happening? Can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, just by coincidence, last week I presented, I was invited to present to our Senate uh, around a particular bill on rehabilitation. We had our, it was not three minutes, we had seven minutes and all of us, all four witnesses were cut off in the middle. So <laughs> that, um, uh, so it was, uh, we'd practice, but we didn't do it well enough. But I think uh, what Senator Winfield says is, um, the, the session is like an hour and a half or something. You have your opening statements, but it's very much what you say afterwards, which counts. And, um, and again, um, the Senate, you know, your audience will vary. So some will care. Um, some will be very well informed. Um, and I think, it, it, I think you, you do want to have the conversation focus on the issues that you consider to be important. Um, it does uh, practice. Um, and again, it's, yeah, practice, and you may want to practice with uh, people who aren't um, super knowledgeable. So it's, it's your practice with people who are like the person just, what does this sound like type of practice um, it would actually um, I'd be very helpful. And does it, and I, I really like what Senator Winfield talks about is what's the pull, what's the emotional, um, and, and it feels uncomfortable mm -hmm. <laughs> to stop um, without having said what you really want the mess, like there's some information or something you want them to get. Um, but you have to, because you can't say it all. Let me go to my next question. Okay. Several reports have come out. We've got ATSA, we've got ALI that have come out with strong progressive positions on what are the inefficiencies of public notification and the concerns about this one size fit all approach. Uh, do you think that these studies are also tools, right, that could be helpful in dealing with, you know, officials or politicians? Um, can you speak to public notification, your thoughts uh, in general about it? This is for me? Yep, you, Dr. Hansen. Yeah. Um yeah, no, I think there's many voices in the conversation. And I think that having uh, groups on your side help. They, they certainly don't um, always carry the day, but you have, it, you, when you position yourself, um, you have to position yourself somewhere. Sometimes you're like way out here <laughs> and sometimes you have to be. You're like, you have to be like a, the loud voice over here. Sometimes you're, you're carrying the whole crew forward. This is just like the ground is still things growing you just have to move it uh, and that's in, but and you do different things in, when the depending on what the the ground is like mm. let me turn to you um senator Winfield. when we do these studies you know like just me as a researcher um i'm always like which is the cart and which is the horse sometimes the questions come from the senate so, i mean meaning the the you know legislators sometimes the questions come all of this is happening in a very sometimes two different you know, lanes that sometimes cross and meet at midnight. Can you just speak to, because when I think of what sometimes comes from legislation, we say we should study it. We need more information from it. We need a report about it. When you all get those reports, like, like is that helpful, right? Can you just speak to like the usefulness? Because just so you know, what I'm balancing um, is that Cindy and I have already done research on the economic impact of the registry, which has included individuals from the state of Connecticut. And while the pandemic slowed us down, I'm hearing, right, Cindy, that this is definitely something that we, we will be releasing so that you all can have more of this information as well. How does that really play into it? Are, you know, can you balance that with the conversation you just had about storytelling, like reports and numbers versus the storytelling? Um, how do they play in? So I, I think often, look, look, I think it matters if people read it, uh, potentially. Uh, the reality is, um, I can't tell you exactly what people have read, but I can tell from the conversations that I'm hearing from uh, many legislators that much of what the research actually is, is not read. And if it's read, uh, it's not always understood. Uh, we just had a... <laughs> just had a conversation about cannabis in which someone stood up holding a report that I had read, telling me what the report said and apparently didn't understand what the report said, nor did they read the footnotes in the report, which of course 
not everybody's going to do, but it's important to understanding what the point actually is. And so, you know, look, these things are important because you have individuals who use them to make their arguments and they tend to, th those will be the people on your side. Um, but I think generally uh, it is important to have information out there. I think what, what you all, uh, not you, you're the researcher, but you all collectively should be thinking about is how does uh, that information get relayed? If you hand me the report, the likelihood is I'm not going to get the information. If you sit down in front of me and at three minutes and start to battering me with the information, I'm not going to receive it. So the, the nexus is that the story you tell, if you tell it well, allows me to recognize that there's something I need to know beyond what I currently know. And then I might actually say, well, how do I find out what you know? What, what do you mean? Where is that? Uh, and I think that's what we should be doing. But we tend to show up trying to get all of the information in a report in, in the three or five minutes that we have. And I think that's exactly the wrong course of action. I think another thing that you point out is that who is our audience and therefore what effort did we make to reach that audience? Because when my audience is to be published in a manuscript and the people who will read that manuscript in that journal will go and understand all of that text, you know, one of the things that we've seen is how do we move more into an Instagram, you know, media push that says, let's teach people more about this topic in five slides. Let's just open this door a little bit wider um, in a more informal sense so that when it is time for it to be formal, it feels less as far um, of information, I think, I think is part of the barrier. Um, and one more, one more thing. I know we're, we're getting short on time, but I, but I think for this and any other issue you're involved in, I think we have to think about it as an as an issue that might have a campaign connected to it, not just people who are advocating for the issue. And what would a campaign around this issue look like? How would you build that campaign? Now, maybe the case that you can't. Right? Some issues I think are very difficult to do that. But if you're not even be, if you're not even having that holding that as part of your thought, then I think you're missing a huge part of this. Because if you can do that, you can do things like we do on other things with videos and people saying things and all of that stuff that are going to penetrate in ways that you sitting in front of a legislature doesn't. Wow. Um, the, a question. Uh, other, Go ahead, other, Paul. Just Sorry. one more comment on on influence. Um, in criminal justice, there are certain people who have tremendous influence who may or may not be elected politicians. Um, Figure out who those people are. Um, be nice to them. Spend time with them. Um, make make them uh, accept your emails um, or phone calls or whatever. So finding the nodes of influence is really quite important. Sticking in this lane of policy and in reports, one of the main uh, pieces that we saw come out of the ALI. Uh, legal study group, right, is that there's a recommendation, as you kind of spoke to, about should the registry not be public here in the United States, right? If a non-public registry would at least do potentially less harm in certain areas. Uh, Dr. Hansen, can you speak to what would need to happen in your thoughts in order for a recommendation like that to be considered? Is there any thoughts or barriers that have been spoken about of what it would take to move from public to non-public here in the United States? Mm -hmm. I think it. Um... I think my view is probably the change would be incremental. I think the individuals who are currently at no significant risk or no higher risk than you or I, we should be able to find some way to get those people off. Um, and then we could substantially restrict the application. And I think that'd be the first step. And then once we have that step and the world doesn't fall apart, we may be able to restrict it further. My next question from our audience is about, you know, just taking us back to the documentary. When we look at Shauna's story, um, part of what she did was take a plea bargain. And the question just is speaking to, uh, you know, Dr. Hansen, can you comment? Do you think a jury trial would have had any different outcome? I don't know. Right. I, I, okay. I, I, I My can't. thoughts similarly, right? We, we speak about in criminal justice in general, 95 to 98 kind of percent of trials here in the United States ending in plea bargain is very common and in plea bargain, very rare to have gone to a jury trial. Well, can, um, I, can, I, can I just say that yeah. like, you know, what, what may be risked is a trial tax where the charges uh, increase and, and what is at risk is, is even more than uh, what you plea bargain for, right? So I think uh, that question is often asked, well, what if I didn't go to trial? What if I just pled this case? The reason why people don't do that is because there is a there is a trial tax of sorts, right? That if you fail, 
you are going to give up much more for much longer. It's much more punitive. And so this system is developed in this way. I think it's unfortunate uh, because it, it, even if you're even if you're actually innocent, <laughs> yeah. you weigh the cost. Uh, there, there's almost no no sense in going to trial. Mm -hmm. Wow. The, our, one of the questions in in our Q and A as you know about informing the public, right? Uh, is an extensive PR campaign across multiple media showing the negative effects of the registry what we need? Is the solution, you know, that if we lift up or, you know, shift public opinion that then legislators won't have to act fearfully on behalf of the public? Can I pass that to you, Senator Winfield? Any thoughts, right? Kind of spoke about, is, is it that we need like, a month and we have a month, right? Is it that we need, you know, what is, is it that we need a day at the, the Capitol? We have that. What, what, what thoughts do you have about how we make it bigger or bolder as we continue to move forward with reform? Yeah, as, as I was just suggesting, I think uh, thinking about an issues campaign, thinking about what that looks like uh, is important. Is the question um, that we can show the harms of the registry as was suggested, is, is the question that we can show that there are a significant number of people who uh, have been harmed in the past who, who don't feel like uh, this is a solution to the problems they have. Uh, what is the way, I, I can't sit here and tell you what it is, but I do think it's important uh, that we begin to think of this not, a, not only uh, as an advocate or a set of advocates coming in, talking to us and, and inside of that building that we have wherever we are located in the United States, but uh, as, an issue that is opened up so that the public begins to understand either that there are consequences for the registry, because I think most of the public don't think about the registry at all, right? Yeah. Why would they? It's just not a, it's not, a, not a part of their lives. So you have the public that if they know anything, they know there's harm. That's it. End of story. They're done. You have legislators who uh, have data, but they know that the public knows harm, right? So, so there's a lot of work that has to be done, a lot of ground that has to be tread that is not really being done right now. And I think it's it's fertile ground and we should plant seeds in it. To jump to you, uh, Dr. Hansen, there's this, you know, research to practice piece that's in the discussion. And, and of course, policy is always in that, but the research is there. We have tons of researchers that say, show me anywhere that this, you know, has led to less crime or more safety. There's tons of researchers that say, look at the collateral consequences of people not being able to find housing or being pushed into all of these things. We have tons of research that says, we can tell you that people don't even know where to go. They don't know what an orange dot is or a green dot is. They don't know what tier one or tier three is. And that they're often mushing one scary boogeyman offender in their mind when they have this you know, kind of thought. So then if there's actual research that says those things and to Senator Winfield's point, Maybe we're not telling them in the most, you know, com like compelling story way. What might your charge to those who are in a knowledge base, those who are doing research, those who are in practical spaces? What, what, how might we challenge them to move forward? Just like I asked him. Well, I think events like today are are, are exactly what we should be doing. We should be engaging with uh, sympathetic um, political uh, actors. Uh, we should be having public. Uh, dissemination and make them open, <laughs> no secrets about it. Um, I think you have to engage the people who are potentially uh, have an ear um, and um, look for opportunities. I think the timing, I guess, is really important as well. There's sometimes when, you know, in my career, I started off years and years ago where I spent a lot of time making sure that uh, sexual abuse was an issue. I started off in the early 80s and people were ignoring it. People were laughing and, at victims of sexual assault and kids were being victimized and nothing was happening. Um, and so I spent a lot of time doing the exact opposite but in, in doing, uh, making it, raising the concern. Um, and, and, you know, quite, I was part of a, you know, a group of people and did. And now, and now I think we have to sort of moderate that concern. I think that this concern is still real, um, but we have to be, find a way of creating the, the, the right voice um, that would uh, uh, balance, um, uh, balance the, the overall consequences of what we're doing. It is 10 o'clock, but I do have a few more questions in our Q&A. So if you all are willing to hold on for a few more minutes, then I will still ask a question or two more, if that's all right. Okay. So um, our audience uh, 
you know, in, in the messaging responded really positively to the three elements that you outlined, uh, Dr. Hansen, that spoke to uh, the types of supports that individuals might need. Um, and then they said, man, this is something that people definitely need to know. So uh, how do we bring supervision authorities into a pro-social function, even if it's inconvenient for them? Yeah. Um, probation officers, I guess that's supervision authorities you're probably talking about, mm -hmm. uh, are... are um, many of them want to help. And I, I don't think that's the movement is that, uh, that far. I think a lot of the people perceive themselves as being in the helping, helping business. It's training and it's support. And it's also rewarding them for doing the right things. So it, often they get rewarded for catching people doing bad stuff and they have a, a checklist of what they get rewarded for. Um, so reward them for somebody who does well, right? You know, this guy's got a job. How many people did you help get a job? You know, make that part of the uh, criteria, job performance. Um, and I think, I, I think you can do it. Um, there's many probation services around the world um, that are very much involved in the, the helping business. Um, I think it's, 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 it's doable. The next question from our uh, chat that I'll ask, right? It just speaks, uh, all agree that sexual harm is morally and legally unacceptable. All can agree that persons who are harmed likely have different responses to the harm and all should be able to agree that prevention should be a great goal. So then the question is, should advocates in the arena of sexual harm pay more attention to prevention and restorative justice and be less concerned about ending the registry? I yeah, go ahead, Senator. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that that I wouldn't tell people what their activism should be, I guess is where I would start. Um, you know, we, we come to these spaces for various reasons. Uh, I, I do think that we should all be able to agree upon those things that uh, were suggested we should all be able to agree upon. But I don't know that we all actually do either. Um, as was suggested, I think that um, victims for instance, do come in different types uh, with different perspectives, but in the space where I am, they tend to uh, be looked at as a monolith. So I wouldn't say that uh, even in that space that uh, all legislators would agree with that statement. Um, and I think that has impact on what it is people uh, may or may not uh, be choosing to do here. Um, Look, I, I think uh, there, is an, there is immediate harm being done by the way in which these registries operate. Um, and I think it is critical that th that, that harm ends. Uh, I think it's also important that we, we deal with the issues of prevention. I, I, I don't think, uh, I think there are enough people who are concerned about this issue that all of these things can be done. I don't think you need to say, well, we'll deal with prevention, uh, but not the harm being done. Uh, for, because for a very good reason, and I say this about a lot of the things we work on, I don't get to be uh, the age I am ever again. Time is moving. Uh, and, and that harm needs to stop uh, because it's harming people to death. Uh, and as we already talked about, there are consequences, not only for the individual, but to go beyond that individual. So I, I think um, I would not agree with the, the notion that we do one or the other. We have pretty much made it to what will be our last question. So um, do you see any realistic possibilities of remediation of the collateral consequences of SORNA, right? Whether in terms of law or in terms of state boards of licensure for those who have had professional certifications. Pass that to you, Dr. Hansen. Any, do you see? I'm not actually quite sure what the, the, the question is, I'm sorry. So it's saying, do we see any possibilities of remediation? So remediation of the collateral consequences of SORNA. So then I am imagining that that's for the individuals who potentially have been convicted and then are experiencing the consequences of our sex offender registry and notification yeah. act. Yeah, so the way I'll respond to that is I, I'm heartened to see a, a movement in um, many countries, and particularly the United States, towards a more rehabilitative goal of, for corrections. I know there's some big systems that went from, you know, the Department of Corrections to the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And this has been accepted um, with a pretty broad uh, party support as a movement for most people with a criminal justice history. 
Yes, I think it's possible to go the next step and even include people with a sex offense history. Yeah. I just want to take a moment and thank you both, Dr. Hansen, Senator Winfield. Your time today has been immensely valuable. You've shared as, as we started both your professional but also your lived experiences. We know that these types of conversations, they take courage, but they also provide clarity. They offer opportunities for individuals in our communities to be with us and to potentially learn with us. Um, so I, I will just take a few minutes to give a final remarks um, to those of you all in our audience. Thank you for your time today. Uh, hopefully you have learned and have benefited not only from today, but also you'll take the time to watch the prior uh, recordings that are from this series. Uh, on behalf of One Standard of Justice, we thank you. Um, on behalf of myself, Dr. Daniel Cooper and the University of New Haven, I thank you. And so um, we'll close out the webinar at this time and you all are free to go. Thank you so much. Right.